My name is Carl Blythe. I'm the director of CORAL, the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. And today uh, we have a webinar and it's, um, that is all about remote language teaching, activities for remote language teaching. And it could not be a more timely topic since with the COVID pandemic, all of us are now teaching remotely and we're learning in, uh, how to do it and we're teaching each other how to do it even better. Um, we have three speakers here today with us and I'll introduce them in just a minute. But I do wanna say before we begin that CORAL has a OER course. Remember OER stands for Open Educational Resources. We have an entire course on our, uh, if you come to our homepage, there is a pull down men menu that says OER and then we have an entire online course that you can take to learn the ins and outs of OER. How to read licenses, open licenses, how to find the content that you're looking for, how to use repositories, how to remix, and on and on and on. So um, today we're having a discussion, as I said, with three people, and we'll have a Q&A following that. So there is a button at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom uh, field that says Q&A. So you can just click there and type in your questions. We'll be monitoring the questions um, and saving those questions for the very end. But uh, make sure that you type them in as the thought arises, otherwise you might forget. So questions and or comments, everything is welcome. Okay, uh, so let's get started. Uh, we have three speakers, Olivier Grugan, uh, a virtual uh, a learning specialist in Arabic, Spanish and German, an instructor, and she comes from us from the World of Learning Institute at Appalachia Intermediate Unit 8, which is in Pennsylvania. And she'll tell us a little bit more about uh, the World of Learning Institute and the work that they're doing, how, to, how they interface with public schools. Next up, we have Catherine Ousla, who is a French teacher at Mount Vernon High School. And we know Catherine from many years. She's attended workshops at, at Coral and she's a heavy user of digital technology and knows lots about online learning. And finally, Daniel Verdugo, who's a Spanish teacher at Huron High School. Uh, and so the three of them are going to talk a little bit, like five to seven minutes, share their ideas for their various activities for remote learning. And then again, at the end, we will um, have a Q&A. So I'm going to turn things over now to Olivia. Thank you, Carl. Um, I'm very excited to be with you all today. I got to meet a couple um, of you at ACTFL. It was my first time at ACTFL last fall, and that was, of course, a very exciting experience. Um, I start as a brick and mortar, regular public school classroom teacher, um, and I started in that environment. Um, actually, in the Middle East was my first regular classroom teacher job, um, and I speak Arabic, German, and and Spanish and for different reasons. Some of them I grew up with and some of them I've actually done the hard work of acquiring um, as, as a non-child. And um, now I work for the World of Learning Institute at Appalachia Intermediate Unit, which Carl asked me to share a little bit about if you're outside of Pennsylvania. Um, I think other states call them educational service agencies, but a lot of states there's different ways to organize it, of course. Um, a lot of states have agencies that are that serve to provide services to school districts that individually may um, have trouble providing those services based on their size, um, their budget, their location. And so one of the services that we provide through our intermediate unit, which is in the center and in a relatively rural area of Pennsylvania, um, is the service of foreign language education or world language education. And so we recognized a need within our, our public school districts um, to offer languages that they may not be able to find someone or hire someone or offer a full time job to someone to teach in the school district. So we say we're the next best option. If you can't find somebody in your school district to offer that language, but your students want to have access to them, rural students should have access to language choices too. So we offer seven languages um, and we offer it through a, a somewhat unique format, which is um, our teachers are throughout the state. They actually, some of them live outside of Pennsylvania and they offer live virtual sessions in Zoom, just like we're all in here now. Um, and students in their public schools 
access those virtual sessions on a set schedule. Um, and many of them are sitting in their school library, guidance counselor office, maybe an empty classroom with the power of professional. And they're able to join with a couple of kids from some other rural schools. And at the same time, that, that um, combination of students can come together and receive classes in Japanese or in Latin or in Arabic or a language that they might not author otherwise be able to um, have access to. So it was a compelling um, vision for me as someone who speaks multiple languages and as a teacher myself wouldn't have the opportunity probably to teach each of those in a school. Um, and in some contexts wouldn't have the opportunity to teach them at all like Arabic. So for me as a teacher, it was a way that I could, that I could tap into some of my passions. Um, but I, also, I was also having grown up rurally, I think really compelled by the idea that, that students who have, may have trouble accessing opportunities should of course have them as well. So that's our sort of, that's our model at the world of learning. And what that means is that we have been teaching remotely for years. And so we are not making this transition right now, like everybody, like many others, right? And I think that's important to acknowledge because making the transition in April looks very different than when you get to think about it the summer before and prepare for the upcoming school year, right? So, um, you know, I've been teaching my, my students uh, who were sitting in their brick and mortar schools since September. Now, of course, they're home, but we have a lot of our routines and norms established already. So the students see me in, in most of our schools two or three times a week for about 45 minutes live. Um, and then on the other two or three days when they don't see me, they have work, they have material to access and work through what we call asynchronously on their own time um, online. We use a platform called Canvas, but there are of course lots of different platforms you could use to provide students with material um, outside of those live sessions. So what I want, so that's, that's a little bit about the background. What I wanted to share with you as far as we were asked to share sort of one activity or thought and um, making the transition for me from brick and mortar to virtual, I'll caveat by saying was, was a difficult choice because I really love being in the same room as my students, right? Um, so one of the ways that it has helped me to frame this transition that allows, again, allows my students access is to think about what is good teaching, right? And of course, there are lots of different ways to think about that. We take our own vision of good teaching and to say, we're not abandoning that, we're just figuring out how to do that in this new context, right? So one of the, like, to me, one of the key pieces of good teaching that I've experienced as a student um, are routines, classroom routines. Right. And those can, of course, be varying degrees of effective, but um, they those routines provide consistency. They provide, as we know, as, as language teachers, how important repetition is. Right. So they provide repetition. Um, they routines, I think, really allow us to stay in the target language in a way that is otherwise, of course, challenging. But once students get familiar with a routine, we can use the target language at a much higher rate than we might if we didn't have those routines. I think they build confidence in our students because they come in and they know what to expect. We do this, this, this. I can do this. I've done it before, right? Um, and, and they make our teaching more efficient. We have limited amount of time with our students. In a remote environment, our time is often even more limited. And so those routines allow us to transition quickly and be efficient. So I wanna share with you today in my, in my short, probably moment or two that I have left, um, just a, a visual glimpse of some routines that I have utilized. I wanna show you my Arabic class routines because I know Arabic's a language that doesn't always get quite the same attention um, that some of the other wonderful languages get. So these will be, the visuals will be in Arabic, but you can imagine them translating, of course, to any number of other languages. Um, so three things that I do in my Arabic class. This first screen is our, um, this first slide is our bell ringer screen, our, our bell ringer slide. Um, and I've actually started this year pulling parts of it out and leaving bits blank. So this part up here in the top left at the beginning of the year would have the date. And this would be a full greeting. And this part over here on the right would say objective. And this part would say um, calend uh, dictation. Right, so the students have seen these parts before. And as the year goes along, I start pulling some of those typical um, subheaders out. 
And then at the beginning of class, I ask students, I'll use my panelists, I'll just use your names as an example. I'd say, Sarah, can you put the date in here? And Daniel, why don't you complete the greeting? And Carl, can you write the word objective? Um, and then the students use the annotate tools within Zoom and they start filling out this first screen, right? So it gives, gets them immediately kind of engaged, but in a very routine way where they can build that confidence. Um, and of course, I have a bell ringer that they can do in the chat. And we might start talking about some of our objectives for the lesson. We might talk about the agenda. So that's what, you know, I think of that as good teaching in the, in the brick and mortar. We try to do that in a virtual environment too. Um, and to show you what that looks like when students are there and they've written on the screen, this is after they've sort of um, written some, some of those pieces in on the screen, right? So that's what that might look like. Sometimes I use the first screen just as a real quick warm up too, especially if people are gathering. And in the target language, I say, point to the color pink, point to the words um, that means peace, point to the number three, point to the color blue. And students can use this arrow tool to just sort of point around and quickly show comprehension, you know, and warm us up while we're, while we're getting started for the, for the lesson. So that's one routine. Um, another routine I use is a dictation routine where, because in Arabic, of course, they're learning another alphabet. So I say a couple words in Arabic, have them write them in their own notebook. There's nothing wrong with using, you know, an old fashioned notebook, even though we're in the virtual environment. Have them write them in their own notebook and then I'll choose four students or let them volunteer and say, Daniel, can you write your word up here? Carl, write yours there. Sarah, write yours there. Um, and then we can all look at the words together and we can identify, you know, areas for correction or growth. So here's an example where students did some writing and then we might have written over top and sort of corrected some pieces or looked at their letter formation um, collectively as a class. And the third routine I wanted to share with you and the last one is a calendar routine, which of course you could translate into other languages too. The, these questions ask, what is today? What was yesterday? What will tomorrow be? And these sentence starters say, today is, yesterday was, tomorrow will be. And then I have a reminder about um, the day, the number, the month, and the year. And so again, I'll ask students either to write or to unmute and tell me um, how to finish each one of these sentences. And we can do it in different styles each time, whether they're unmuting or writing. Um, and what it might look like after they've sort of gotten to scribble on the screen is a little messy, but this is them annotating within Zoom on the screen. And because we're all looking at it, it would be like in a brick and mortar students coming up to the whiteboard and writing on the whiteboard. Because we're all looking at the same screen, we can obviously discuss um, any of the issues that we wanna discuss. So those are just three of the routines. And I, you know, there are other ones that I think are important in, in other language areas and depends of course on the level of student. But um, that's what I, that was my thought for today was about even if you're transitioning in April, right? Even if you didn't start this at the beginning of the year, um, I think you can think about one opening routine and one closing routine. Our closing routine is everybody unmutes their mics and we say in whatever language, tres, dos, uno, right? And then when I'm done with three, two, one, everybody says goodbye. Um, and that little quick closing routine gives that kind of sense of finality and makes it really clear when it's okay to click leave meeting and exit. So that, that's the piece that I wanted to emphasize today. Thank you. Thank you. That's, um... Thanks very much, Olivia. That was terrific. The concept of routines, um, because that, that ties nicely together with the notion of formulaic language. A lot of language needs to be repeated. And you're right, uh, it, it helps teachers stay in the target, it helps students stay in the target language because they, it, they know what to expect. So it's, it just makes for kind of an efficient management of teaching. Okay, so let's now move on to Catherine. Catherine, I mentioned, is a French teacher at in Washington State uh, in high school and she has a lot of years experience teaching online. So Catherine, take it away. Well, many thank yous. Um, I, I'm excited to be here because yesterday I was doing the flinge and I see several of the flinge people in here so there might be some repetition. I apologize but not really because we have a lot of people here looking for some new ideas as well. Um, I'm really impressed with Olivia because I do uh, French, German, Italian, and Spanish and my, my oh and so I work on Hebrew and I'm trying to see if I can pick some things out. So thank you so much for that. I love languages that have a different, uh, different appeal to them. So I'm gonna share my screen right away because I wanna show you, um, I am not a synchronous teacher because of the um, situation I'm in a rural part of Washington state 
where <clears throat> my students really just don't have access. And we've only been, um, we only have 30 minutes per week of work that we are supposed to give to them. So when I do this, I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm really connecting the students to a lot of interpretive tasks. I don't want them trying to produce a lot of presentational writing or speaking or interpersonal speaking would be great. We, we have ways we could do that, but um, and my, the feedback on that is the kids aren't gonna just do that easily. So I'm working on a lot of the interculturality and interpretive tasks. And I'm gonna show you how I set that up for the students so that they can, they can get to this when they feel like they have the time. So I'm gonna start over here. The first one, um, first one I'm gonna show you is I was cruising Twitter and I found um, a tweet by Amanda Sandoval, who is an amazing, um, she's, a, she's not a language teacher, but she, she does a lot with Google templates and slides. And I do too, but I thought, well, if I'm going to create sort of a choice board or a path for my students, like a path to proficiency, oh, I wonder where I've heard that before. <laughs> um, I designed this and we had just finished a unit in all of my, um, my classes when we closed the buildings. So I thought, okay, I don't necessarily need to go on to the next one that I thought I was gonna go on to. So I opened it up and I said, well, we're all stuck at home anyway. Let's talk about food. That's what we're doing, we're eating at home. And so I made sure for level two, three, and four that we have different global themes attached to food. And the first one for French 2, I'm going to make this real big here so you can see it, is it's um, mes préférences alimentaires. And it's also, it's about food and your habits and what you like to eat and why. Now I chose that because usually that leads into our school lunch portion of the, of the unit where the students are exploring school lunches from around the world and comparing them to ours. But we're just looking at this first one. That's week two. I'm going to go back to week one. Okay, so this is the first slide I send out to them. So I have our, um, our guiding question right here. I just put the one. So what are my food preferences? What do I like or dislike certain foods? Really, that's a very you know, novice mid task, but I wanna just, because I don't wanna overwhelm them with a lot of new vocabulary, making it <clears throat> pretty, pretty um, comprehensible. So we have our can do's. I can identify a variety of food and their food groups. I can explain my preferences. So they've got uh, my website down here that I've had for so many years, they can go visit that. And then there's of course a Quizlet so that they can just practice on their own time. But this fourth one is where they're going to do their work. I also have two videos for them because I'm not there giving them the input. Both of these vi uh, videos deal real basic language for little kids on what the food groups are. So they're gonna go watch that. The seesaw activity that I prepared for them is the first time I've done an actual activity. I've used seesaw since it opened up, but I've never pushed out an activity to the students. So this is my first one ever. Thank you, Nathan Lutz from New Jersey. That's your second shout out this week. So on the first page of seesaw, and this is a free platform. You have so many different ways to do that. Um, go watch some tutorials. I put out the directions on the first page. So I tell them on page two, you're gonna look at the food and food groups, what words can you recognize? That's all I'm asking them to do. The second one, they're going to organize pictures of foods into the food groups and they're doing a drag and drop, okay? And on the third activity on page four, they're going to um, put food words under categories, I like, I don't like, I refuse to eat, I've never tried. Then they're going to record themselves saying six of those sentences. So you notice part of my directions are in French and part of them are in English, just to make sure we all know what's going on. So on the first page, on this first slide after that, they just see pictures. These are authentic resources from Canada and from France about the food groups. They're very comprehensible. They've got images and most of the words my students can recognize because French is their third language after Spanish or English. So here was the first activity and this one's already been done. You see that I just have the categories for the students and then there were pictures. So there's basically very little reading comprehension, but they had to have looked at this to get the new words from, um, from our set. So then they drag, 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 and then I can just tell right away. Um, the best part is, is that they don't know that um, avocados are fruits. They don't know that zucchini are fruits. They don't know that peppers are fruits. So I get to give them some feedback. I can send it back to them. I can give them feedback and say, hmm, if it has a seed, 
it's a fruit. So, and then um, a lot of them didn't quite get what a feculant, it's like a, a grain or cereal. So we have to go back and just look at, you know, make sure everybody's got that. So then the third activity, here are all the food words, and those were on the sides before. The students drag, drag, drag. They need to know, they knew this from our, from our Quizlet and from my website, what these new food words are. So some of them I made very easy for them to understand. So like fraise and in Espanol, fresas and artichokes, you know, choose words. Some of them are comprehensible and some of them are new. So it's, it's a balance, okay? When they get that, I did give them a gloss because they've never heard me say, je n'ai jamais essayé. That's something new for them. So I glossed it right up there. And then, then they recorded themselves. And this student hasn't done that yet, but she, um, he needs to work on that. So I can see all of my students work right here. I think if we go into Blanca's, okay. And then here's her recording. So she chose six sentences. So she has the sentence starter, the sentence frame right there. I really like to eat. I don't like, I refuse to like, I refuse to like, I refuse to eat. They record themselves and then I can hear them trying out that new vocabulary. That's a great way to do that. <clears throat> and that, that helps them sort of stay on task where they know, here's what we're going to do. Here's some practice, practice, practice so that I can come to my task and meet it with, with hopefully good confidence. Okay, so they've got a new one this week where now we're, we're describing food. Okay, so they're, they're, their first chunk was, I like to eat cherries. And our second one, our second text they're going to be working on, I like to eat cherries because they're sweet and juicy. So we're, we're upping our level by adding on that because statement. Okay, so we're pushing a little bit towards that intermediate low with giving description. So I just gave them another quick vocabulary review. How do we describe food? And I put pictures, I gave them images, and I gave them some examples. We're also looking at um, uh, adjective agreement. Okay, so I'm putting a little grammar in there. I also have a video that I made with my plastic fruits and vegetables that they can watch. I'm not sure if they're going to, but I'm wearing the same shirt, by the way. <laughs> and then I have a, um, a Disney uh, video, it's called A Table. It's a really good series for French teachers. It's pretty comprehensible, but I'm having them fill out a Google form that explains what they understood. And I made these real basic. So just like, here, go watch this and tell me what you understood. So I'm just getting this interpretive mode, right? I also gave them, this is so much fun. Last year's group worked on these little video avatars. It's called My School Avatar. It's an app for um, uh, iPhones. We have iPads at our school, so the kids took pictures of foods they like and they don't like, and they had their little avatar, and then they were speaking in it, and the avatar, of course, talks. It's kind of like Vokey from back in the day, and that way, now, since we can't do this in class, right, I'm substituting that with the students watching last year's students who might be some of their friends. So their names, only their first and the, and the first name and the first initial is there. So they're gonna go watch three of their friends speaking French, describing exactly what we're talking about. And they're gonna come back and, and explain in English, what did you understand? What are some of the food vocabulary words that they used? So I'm not having them produce it right away. I'm having them listen to authentic material and then other students so that they can kind of compare, okay? Um, that's French two, right? So that's a nice level. And then I was going to show you real quickly, this is French three and French four. And our goal is to look um, at identité culinaire et géographique. So food identity and geography. How does the geography and where you live impact the, the, the regional cuisine that you're known for? And that's a big term because we're going to start in the United States my students are a bit unexperienced with the United States and they needed some input. So I started actually with English. I've got two videos that show the most popular foods from each state and they came back because they had to fill out this Google form and they were horrified by some of the things that people eat around the world. And I said, you know, or about around the States. And I said, you gotta go out. And that's why we travel is to learn about food. So we're getting in this interculturality um, when we did that, the students were watching those videos, and then I had a Google form up here, the sondage, 
and then a learning apps activity. And that'll be probably the last thing I show you. If you've never seen learningapps.org, it's a free site that has so many different ways to make quizzes or games or activities. And then you push them out to your students just by a link. So this one is a map of the United States because really we need to work on geography at some times. They click on a pinpoint and all these food pictures come up and they can actually click on here like walleye sandwich. And they're gonna look at Santa, you know, Santa Fe and they're going to say, hmm, I think the food specialty is this. And it says select this one. And they'll know if they're right, there's a little check mark over here when they're all done. My next one is going to be, it's, uh, it's gigantic. It's with ThingLink. If you haven't seen ThingLink before, it can be kind of expensive. Um, they've gone back and forth with their pricing. And this one, a lot of the French teachers know it. It's, um, it's somewhat um, intense. So this is a map of France. And there's, for each region, what's grown or produced or harvested in that region and then a dish that's made with it and a recipe and then you can go shopping to buy the ingredients and so they're going to find one of the regions and go shopping for that and decide what would you make if we were together because we always have a cooking night um, this is their virtual shopping trip so all this interculturality is we start local we talk about washington state what are we known for salmon and coffee then we go to the united states and then we go global and so we start with France, we look at the geography, we look at things that people would do and see, et cetera, and then we'll hit the world in the next, um, in the next level. I have uh, lots of things. If you want to see or use any of these, just send me an email or tweet me. Um, I shared these out on Flange yesterday. So, um, well, the last thing, really super quick, for those French two kids, this is the Google map that I made, and it goes all the way over to Polynesia, Francaise. These are school lunch menus from around the world. So when the students click on it, they get to see a picture of the school and then they get to see the menu. The only problem is, is that no one's eating school lunch right now. So I have to give them menus that are a little bit so from January, but the school does have that on there. So I just give them the January menu and say, okay, let's just pretend we're there today. So Carl, <clears throat> with that, I will stop sharing my screen okay. and pass it back to you. Thank you so much. Very, very rich uh, resources. I like, like how you've taken from all different kinds of platforms and different images and put them together to make a really very, very rich lesson. Thank you. Um, so let's now move over to Danielle. But before, before Danielle uh, starts talking, let me remind everybody, if you have a question, you need to write the question in the Q&A button. I see some questions are appearing in the chat room. There's lots of activity in the chat room, but the chat room is mainly to have kind of uh, your own conversations or to, to, to post links. If you want a question to be directed to our speakers, please put that in the Q&A, okay? I see we have about 15 questions already, so that's good. So Danielle, we'll, we'll, you are um, our, our finalist here, so you're the last person. Take it away. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, for me, it's a great honor to be here in this in this webinar today. And um, so for today, I brought uh, an activity um, that I'm working with my class remotely now. I teach Spanish in, uh, in our public schools. And uh, so this activity is related to a project that I'm uh, that I'm leading. I'm I'm sharing with with all of you here in the chat the link the link to the project and so let me share my screen let me share my screen and we'll go to the project to give more context right so this is any magazine we publish we publish a magazine at the end of each semester so this is a project that is developed entirely on uh, on google slides and it's a project that promotes collaborative learning by literacy and key digital skills. So um, currently the project um, is being developed, uh, as I say, in our public schools. I have four different groups of Spanish, four with a total of about 90, uh, 90 students. And this issue that I'm sharing here with you, this is the, uh, the end product of the, first, of the first semester this year. So um, I wanted to uh, let you know a little more context about, about the magazine before I jump into the activity. Um, what I can tell you about publishing, publishing student work is that uh, really engages our students 
in the learning process, right? Um, as it allows them to pursue their interests and, and share them with real audiences. You have here, for example, a um, group of students that they created this, this green club and they wanted to share what they're doing, their work with our school community. So they, they wrote this little article here to share in our magazine. The next thing uh, that I want to talk about this magazine is that for us, for language teachers, uh, it can be very interesting because with a magazine project, with a publishing project, we can uh, incorporate culture, the arts, history in our classroom. So for example, the first semester, we were celebrating the, the 500th anniversary of the conquest of Mexico. So uh, students did a unit of inquiry in, um, in the conquest. And then they got to write too about more controversial topics like uh, the uh, La Malinche and the role of the Malinche in the conquest. So that was, uh, that was very fun. You can see here, uh, everything that you see again is all done in, in Google Slides. So it's also interesting that uh, we can do this type of project without investing so much in, in, in new software, right? We did uh, Frida Kahlo too, as part of our um, integration of the arts. So students end, ended up writing a biopic of uh, Frida Kahlo and then an analysis of one of her masterpieces, Las Dos, Las Dos Fridas, right? So, um, and the last thing um, I want to share with you that recently the project, this magazine was, uh, well, the Hispanic Latino Commission of the state of Michigan here feature the magazine uh, for, for what I think it's a very remarkable achievement, and is that we are publishing the first bilingual magazine in our town, in Ann Arbor. So uh, this type of project, publishing magazines or publishing uh, newsletters, uh, it's a great tool, not only for developing communication skills for our students, but also to engage them, to engage them in uh, the cultural life of their communities that I think that uh, is very important as well. All right, so with this, I wanted to jump right away on the activity that I got here for you. We are working right now remotely from home for our next edition of the magazine. It's gonna be our sixth edition. So um, this is what I, what I brought to you. I know that my students and your students are probably watching a lot of TV shows, a lot of movies. So uh, um, my proposal for my students was to do a, write a review, a review of uh, something interesting that they're watching, right? So I gave them a little, little template here and uh, these are two examples that I got. Also, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to let you know that um, I decided to make this document open for my students. I mean, like a shareable document where they can read, they can read and write what, they can read what everybody's writing, right? Um, we know that learning is a uh, social activity. We learn from other people, we learn with other people. So uh, at this point that our students are at home, that they're not, they're not seeing their friends. I think it's important for them to, or for us, to create this, uh, to create and foster these learning communities. So um, some of the some of the texts that I got, we got a review of *Parasite* by C.J. We got another review about um, *El Laberinto del Fauno*. So what I did with these reviews, those are the um, uh, like the first drafts that I got. What I did was to take to take these first drafts and add. I corrected. I corrected and revised the content, and then I added some uh, visuals, some visuals as to share back with the students. So the students in the classroom, they can read, they can read what their peers are writing, and also to catch their attention, right, in order to, for them to invite them to write their own thing. And then the, the, the last step, the last step of the activity will be the publishing. So uh, I wasn't planning, on adding a review section in our magazine, but given the circumstances, we're gonna end up with a, with a two page, with a two page full of reviews, right? We're gonna have, as you can see here, the final, the final product will be something like this, the review, review about Parasite, Your Lie in April, and then El Laberinto del Fauno. So this is my proposal um, for you. I know that many of your students are watching a lot of, a lot of media, invite them, invite them to write about it, invite them to reflect about it and share and share what they're doing. Okay, thank you so much, Danielle. That, uh, that's a terrific project. Again, 
really wonderful use of multimedia um, the way you've gotten your students then to the way you've scaffolded even the whole pro publishing process coming coming up with a first draft and then making the second draft better and and more media intensive so um, I'm going to turn things over now to uh, my colleagues at Coral, uh, Natalie and Sarah, because we have a number of questions coming in. Um, people are, are interested in general about how you're doing what you're doing and, and in particular, how do, you, how do you find all this content and how do you weave it together and how do you use, how do you use Seesaw and all these things that you've been talking about? Okay, so Sarah and Natalie, I'll let you, you take things over. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, there were a lot of uh, questions, very specific questions about how you use certain tools, and I'll get to those. But um, since this question, um, I don't know if everyone knows this, but you can vote for questions that are asked. So if a lot of people uh, want that question to be answered, you can vote for it. So one question that received multiple votes was from Edward. He says he works in a very poor school district. Most of his students don't can't access technology and he has to make a packet for them each week. So do you have any engaging activities you would recommend? Or I don't know, any ideas about how maybe what you've shared with us could perhaps be translated into a packet? I know this is kind of um, difficult since we're talking so much about technology, but if anyone has any ideas, that would be great. One of the things I have for um, the students, because as I, I, when I say rural, it was, it's not like Sunnyside, Washington rural, okay? Mount Vernon's its own place. <clears throat> I have lots of students who don't, who didn't have access, so we sent them Chromebooks, and then we tried to get them hotspots. But even then, they don't, they just could not get connected. So for all the stuff that I had, I, um, I have little books that I've um, PDFs that I've made copies of about food, about regions. So they're not going to have the same exact experience, okay? Because we can't replicate the web, we can't replicate that. So I've, I'm sending them home reading. That, that I've had before when we were in class, we would have read these books. So now I have them in PDF, I had them photocopied and I'm giving those out. That's the best I can do for, for our situation. When I see them in the fall, we'll work together through whatever we didn't get to or whatever they missed for that interculturality part, but we'll, we'll work on it. Books. Great. Thank you. Does any, any of the other panelists have any ideas about that or should we move on? I like, I like the books idea too. And I was going to ask, it depends on what level. Um, I have my own classroom library of readers. Mm -hmm. And so now they're home with me and I've been mailing them to students, right. you know, with my name in, in the front right. and I'll get them back whenever I get them back. And then maybe they could keep a journal, like a reading journal. And if they do have at some point, maybe not internet, but if they can take a photo of their writing, I have students who have texted me photos. So if they're keeping like a daily journal in, in Spanish, let's say, after reading a little a chapter of a book, they could take a photo of that and text it to me. So that might be an option. That, that's not a full year solution, but it is sort of a stop gap if you're just here at the end of the year, right? Thank you, that's a great suggestion. Uh, and now we have another question for Daniel, uh, specifically about, actually a few different questions about um, how, the different tools that you use to create the magazine and how did you make it easy for students to access the tools? I think you might have mentioned Google Slides, but could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, as I said, the magazine is entirely done on, on Google Slides. And then, uh, so uh, we try to integrate as much as we can with Google. We use Google Classrooms, we use the entire uh, Google Suite. So uh, um, that's what we use, basically. That's that's all there is. And then, of course, from Google from Google Slides, you can you can download uh, the file as a PDF, and then we upload the file PDF in issue.com, and that's where you can flip through the file as as, as it was a uh, a magazine. But um, Google Slides, that's all there is, really. And someone asked if there is a template for that, or you just kind of create your own. Yeah, no, we um, we start with the blank templates, and uh, as I develop the project, really what I want to do is develop templates for other teachers uh, uh, to make them available to them. Um, but um, I invite I invite all of you if you have an interest in maybe starting with a newsletter, uh, you can start with a um, yeah a blank sheet in, in Google Slides, and then every time it gets easier as you as you do it over and over. But uh, yeah, as I develop the project, 
I would like to, I would like to uh, provide these templates uh, ready to use for other teachers. Oh, that would be awesome. Thank you. Uh, and just while we're talking about this too, I wanted to make one note since we're the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning, um, there's all, all the presenters shared things with a lot of pictures here today. And so I just wanted to remind everyone that I know we're in kind of dire times right now. And so everyone's using whatever resources they can. But um, when, when you have the chance, we advise that you look into Creative Commons licenses too, um, or into images that have Creative Commons licenses. So these are images that um, you're allowed to use legally in all of your resources. And there's places you can search for all these images. So you can really make sure that what you're using is you're allowed to use. But um, yeah, so just a little plug for that. Um, so to go on to our next question, this one was a lot of people upvoted. So I think this is a big concern. Uh, Marie asks, my students don't have to do anything anymore and can take their grade as of March 13th, the day we stop real school, and I'm losing them little by little. They're not interested in learning anymore and are giving up. What is your best advice to get them interested again? I want to jump in. I'm excited about this question. Um, then I'll back out. But uh, I, there always the answer is going to be it depends, right? So if we were going to actually have this conversation one on one, I'd want to ask you about what tools they have access to, um, you know, what you're permitted to use through your district. But I'll just say um, the, the transition, the shift that I've made that has had the most success in and again i was already online with my students but it doesn't mean things didn't change they all went from being in their brick and mortar where the bell rang and they sat down in the computer lab and found me and now they're all at home the biggest transition that i made was i shifted from bell schedule classes to what i've sort of called a coffee break model and the coffee break model and, and again this is on your own availability too what it means for me is i've told my spanish students I'm available, I'm in my Zoom room every single day at 10 a.m. from 10 to 10.30 at weekdays, right? Monday through Friday. And it's a coffee break. Um, so it's not a lesson with a lesson plan because there are also a lot of them are not required to do this work anymore. Um, I'm not necessarily going through all my classroom routines even though that is what I showed you at the beginning of this. Um, but we play games, we read children's books with coffee, with chocolate and milk or, or cookies and milk. You know, I invite them to bring snacks, um, which of course they couldn't do before. Um, we, I share my screen and we play tic-tac-toe and hangman and, you know, different games in, in the target language. Um, and none of it is directly connected to the curriculum, but it's all in the target language. And then I tell them, um, come, I'm on there five days a week, come to two of them or try to come to three of them. Recognizing again, that may not be required either, but, Rather than saying our class is on Tuesdays and Thursdays and it's at 9.04 to 9.57, which I've shifted to this um, coffee break model that's open and daily, and I keep getting more students in it. And I'm not, I don't have my full class percentages. I have around 50% just to be transparent. But week one of going home, I had two kids coming, one kid. Then I got three, four, five, you know, now I have like eight or nine coming to a period that maybe had 15 students originally in it. And new kids are still popping up. So I think they're sitting at home. At some point, they're starting to get a little bored. It doesn't have a grade attached to it. it doesn't, it's fun. They get to see their friends because it's live. Um, I do sometimes put them in breakout rooms. Catherine mentioned breakout rooms earlier. I put them in breakout rooms and I let them chat with each other. And I move between breakout rooms and listen to what they're chatting about. And they're chatting in the target language. Um, so it's been very encouraging to me because I think that in some ways, they're a little bit hungry for something to be going on in their lives. You gotta get the right time though. If you schedule it too early in the morning, they are not awake. So I learned that too, we're, we're shifting, you know, a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Breakout rooms are available in free Zoom. I just saw that, so I wanted to say that. They are available in free, the free accounts. Great, thank you. Any more ideas, Daniel or Catherine? Um, it's, it's a tough question really. Uh, we see that yeah that, that our students they're they're kind of done with uh, with the year with the school year for them um, some of them might be going through a hard time too and and they they just want to be done right so anything that we do in our classes to keep them keep them motivated to see that what they're doing that what they're doing has a purpose uh, other than maybe just the grade because the grade doesn't matter anymore so they have to find you know new motivations to to keep learning. 
just real quick, I would add that, um, say for freshmen, I, I, I know high school kids mostly, um, for, for 10 years, we've conditioned the students and ourselves that school is what happens in this building. Olivia is a little bit different, okay. But when we've taken them out of that box and we've said, okay, school is now in your living room or it's in your bedroom or it's in your basement, the kids how can't that's not a that's not a concept that just flips on a dime nor was it for us so when when we're losing that motivation that that's to be expected because they don't i mean homework was maybe one part of this world but now they're being asked to go watch their teacher if it's synchronous that be patient with everyone because they are going to disconnect. That's just that's just a reality. We'll see them hopefully in the fall. I say hopefully because <laughs> Be patient. They'll come back. They love us. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question, and I feel like we could do probably a whole new webinar on this, but someone asked, what do you think about the evaluation process? How do you grade your students? <laughs> Anyone have? Honestly, I'm just looking at like those picture matching things. I look at it, and did they get it? No. So I send it back, and I'll say, try it again. And if they don't, I still have an engagement from them. One person sent it in and it was just like the kid just pushed pictures into whatever thing. And there I said, really, I'm not gonna score this. I, and what I mean score is I have to click on our grade book attempted. That's what we're doing. We're looking at attempted and um, I'm not gonna give 93.2%. There's just, that's not the world we live in right now. And that's okay because at least they attempted, they looked at it. When they don't engage, then it's an I, it's an incomplete. And that work will need to be made up when we see them again, when we see them again. Yeah, on, on grading, it obviously depends on your district. And because I work in different districts, that's the whole couple of students, probably 12 or 13 different districts. Um, I'm seeing a lot of different versions of this. So for some districts that are doing pass fail, yeah, it's, it's, it's completed or incompleted. I have some districts that are still trying to stick to a graded model. Um, and in one of those, they are one of the districts that I have participating in my daily coffee breaks. And so for that district, I said, um, it's 50 points a week and you can get 10 points each time you attend the coffee break, just attendance. And then if you can't attend five, because they might not be able to, then another, you can get 10 for submitting a free write, where you write in Spanish for 10 minutes, take a picture of it and send me the picture. Um, or you can get 10 points for doing a chat conversation, like texting with a friend in Spanish. Take a picture of your screenshots and send it to me. So they kind of have like ways to get 10 points. It's all still completion, right? Just did you do it? Um, and for the student that might not be feeling that self-motivation at home or whatever, they can attend the live session and for the one who doesn't have great internet and can't attend the live session they can do more free writing so just being very very flexible about what gets you those points and that's just because the district is still requiring grading um, a lot of other districts are not thank you uh, someone else had a question for Catherine about uh, the choice board how did you create that is that through an app that you created it I think you're on mute. They're back. Is it okay if I share my screen on that? Oh, yes. Okay, thank you. I'll come back. So um, somebody asked about my school avatar just real quick. I, there it is. It's $1.99. That's why we have it on our school I am iPads. Okay, this is just a Google slide and I, there. So I put a background on it. And if you look up Amanda Sandoval, I'll put her in the chat in just a minute. She's the one where I got this idea from to like, make a, a path but her first one that i saw and i tweeted this out so if you follow on twitter i was so excited um hers are a lot more visually intense and i made that one first with tons and tons of boxes and pictures and everything and someone gave me some feedback and said that's overwhelming you know we just need the kids to go one two three four five six done it's like um snakes and ladders or i mean i don't know what it is in english but it's that path game that you play um, so how I did it, it's just a text box and then I typed in the text and then you can add links. So you highlight that and then make a link to the thing that you want to do. You can add videos just over here and insert videos. This is a background. And when you click on your background, it'll say right there, 
use, a, use an image. So I chose an image that was hopefully uh, copyright free because I did go to, um, uh, I did go to the correct Creative Commons and did that. Sometimes I try. The Bitmojis, those are from my iPod because I have mine in French. And so then your Bitmoji is in French. So we try and do that. Um, and then I just duplicate it. For the second one, um, just a second. This one, it's the same idea. This is for the higher level. I just took a background image, added the, the, the boxes. You can make pictures links. So you can do a lot of things like that. It's, it's pretty um, copy paste and you're done. Great, thank you. Um, and so someone asked, I think this question was for Daniel, but probably any of the presenters could answer it. Uh, what are movies you suggest for high school students if someone did want to engage their students talking about movies that they're watching? Um, yeah, I in my activity, I, I started the activity recommending, recommending movies. Um, all I can think is that when, when we recommend movies, we should be aware that uh, uh, not to recommend something on Netflix, not to recommend just just as a matter of equity, right? We, we don't want to uh, to be working with things where, where not all our students have access. So uh, try to recommend something that is available on YouTube, that is, is available on uh, Vimeo. So there's a, a I recommended in, in this activity of the reviews, there's one, one short movie called Bird Boy, Bird Boy. And um, it's interesting, it covers uh, themes about bullying and substance abuse, and it's, the setup is in a post-apocalyptic uh, setting, you know, that it's very, uh, you know, for the, for the times right now. So, uh, yeah, that would be my, my recommendation, try to make it as equitable as possible. Great, thank you. Um, someone asked for some quick activities for early levels in Zoom. That's a little vague, but um, if anyone, if Olivia or anyone else has, I wonder. Yeah. I don't... yeah, I'm wondering if we can get a little more guidance on more like types of activities, but I understand, I mean, the basic concept being that you want to think about what early levels can do. And this year I taught an Arabic one and I taught a Spanish one. Um, and um, I, you know, let, uh, just a basic, because I feel like sometimes, again, we're getting onto this theme, it's April, and both of my co-panelists have mentioned this, we may need to keep things sort of basic and focus on the where areas where we can have successes. So if you have students in there live with you in Zoom, the first tool to explore is the chat box and allow, enable it so that students can send private chats. You don't have to navigate out, you don't have to go anywhere else, you don't have to share your screen. Right, but I did a, a session and, and some of my students, their internet is not good now that they're home. So in some cases they're turning off their videos because the video takes up extra bandwidth. They may not be using the mic and yet the chat box is there. They can still hear and see me. So we're in there live, they're looking at me and I had a Spanish class this week where I decided, and it was a Spanish one, just to start asking some questions that were pretty much almost all yes or no questions. And I had them responding in the private chat so I can see everybody's name, they can't see each other's answers, and it was a very quick check for comprehension. And I was saying things like, you know, I was just pulling things from my room. What color is this? What's my name? How many students are here? How many teachers are there? Um, is the teacher a boy or a girl? Very closed questions that were really basic, and they were answering in the chats. And I, I mean, I, it, it's sort of a boring activity, but we, we got a lot of momentum out of it. Like we stuck around with it for a while. And then the more confident student unmuted their mic and started asking some basic questions. Um, and again, I was able to check comprehension because I could see all these little answers pop up, C, 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 and then one student says no. And then it's very quick, oh, that student didn't understand that, right? And you can follow up however you choose to follow up. So there might be ways to do some, I mean, there are ways to do some really basic stuff within Zoom. That's one idea. I don't know if that actually answers where the question was headed. Yeah, but, well, yeah, um, I think Anita asked that, she, so she can ask a follow-up question if not, but that sounds great. Thank you. Um, someone asked, has anyone success, successfully used extempore? I don't know what that is, but anyone? Yes, it looks like Kathleen has. Kathleen, do you wanna? Tell us a little bit about that. It's, um, it's a great way to mimic safe practice for the AP. Um, they're offering it for free right now, which is really generous because it's not a cheap site app. 
Um, when you go there, you can record the audio or you, if you have some recorded audio from native speaker, not from a CD, um, you're uh, able to put that in there and then you can choose how much time the students are going to record themselves and you can have this non, you know, it's, it's an asynchronous conversation, but the students hear the prompt and then reply and then you can keep going back and forth like that and then you get their recorded answer as a complete conversation. Great practice for the AP. Great, thank you. So it looks like we only have four minutes left. We're running out of time and we have still a lot of questions. I'm gonna try to save the questions and maybe see if we can collect some answers and send them out afterwards. Um, I think that's the best way to do it, but we can maybe try to answer one more question. Uh, someone asked, I'm really enjoying this online magazine idea. We did this years ago for ESL. My comment is there were lots of ads popping up as we looked at the magazine. Wouldn't it be fun if the students could create ads as well? Oh, that's, so that's not a question, but an idea. So that sounds like a cool idea. Uh, I think the question about translation is interesting about, because there's several, quite, there's several people who asked the question about what do I do with students who are now using, who are obviously using Google translators? Do you allow that? Do you uh, forbid that? What, what is your take on that? And that's directed to anybody. Anybody want to hand, because that's that's uh, that's an issue now in in remote. It is. is it their original production or are they using somebody else's? But how do you handle those issues? I will, I'm going to just jump in. I, that's why in the beginning I said I'm not focusing on presentational speaking or writing. Mm -hmm. um, we're asking our students. Sometimes I saw a prompt the other day for a French one. Okay, I'm not criticizing, but I, I I saw a French one prompt and it was so far above what. It was, it was asking for full sentences. Mm -hmm. And we know that novice learners are words and lists. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the teacher was saying, oh, these, these kids used Google Translate. And I said, well, look at your prompt. Are you giving them the language? Are you giving a prompt or a task that they can do within their level? If not, the first thing that they're going to do is resort to the translator. If it's something that they can do, like you remember those pictures that I had them do, right? That's something they can do without having to fake it. So just make sure that when, you are, when you're creating your tasks, keep them even one level lower. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great tip. And I, I also think that you can create sort of input-based assignments where the, ta you know, the student is reading or watching something and then demonstrating their comprehension, even if they're demonstrating it in their first language, they're summarizing it, or, or if they're just answering yes or no questions or true false questions, um, but they're getting they're they're getting the input and they're showing that they understand it, but they're not required to put an output up there that's that's higher than their level. I'm 100% in agreement with you on that. Mm -hmm. Great. So I think um, since we are coming up on the hour, it's time to wrap things up. I uh, want to thank our three speakers. Um, so Olivia, thank you. Catherine, thank you. Danielle, thank you. Uh, I think you have so many interesting ideas, um, uh, so many en engaging ideas. I love how you're using all of this media that you're finding and also student generated con uh, content. It's also, it's really wonderful. So let me end um, by mentioning just a couple of things. Here at Coral, we actually put on summer online workshops. Uh, we have two this, this summer, both in June. Uh, the, we have a proficiency workshop for um, anybody who wants to learn more about proficiency language teaching, and that will be June 24th. These, of course, are all online workshops, so they're available for the public. Just go to our webpage and you can register there and find out all the details. And then um, the second workshop we have is the Heritage Spanish workshop. That's June. Uh, 25th and 26th and again that that runs all day and we have um, we have a number of different speakers and they'll have breakout rooms and they'll have all kinds of activities planned finally um, I want to mention that we have something at, at Coral called the learn community and that is the language OER network these are people people like the three presenters today who are creating their own content and they're making what we call OERs are using uh, content from the internet that is uh, that has an open copyright and they sh can share that back to the community. So if you're, a, if you're already doing that and you wanna learn more, 
or if you want to connect with other people to find out how to do that because a lot of the questions today were about which tool did you use and what is that app and so forth there's a lot of knowledge there in the community so come and visit our learn community to learn more about how to create oer and finally i mentioned at the beginning we have our own oer uh, course it's a totally online totally open totally free and you can learn the ins and outs of open education. Thank you again to everybody for your participation. We had over 190 people today listening in. Um, and thanks especially to our presenters, Olivia, uh, Kat, 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 Catherine, and Danielle. Okay? Everybody stay safe and stay healthy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much.